Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Van Dickens here, pastor of the Monroe United Methodist Church. Today our church, our congregation, is taking some much needed time to get away, to worship, praise God, to pray, lots of singing and fellowship out in the country overlooking acres and acres of the most beautiful farmland Iowa has to offer. I ask that you keep us in your prayers and that our time together will be joyful and blessed. I also hope and pray that you may find today's online worship a time of spiritual enrichment in which you may get away, even if it's getting away where there are no distractions in your home, in that room in your home. Turn off your iPhone, or at least turn off the ringer. Minimize any potential interruption and focus on your soul's need to be refreshed and renewed. All of us need that sacred time. It's not being selfish. It's simply taking care of yourself, loving yourself. Someone once said you can't love your neighbor as yourself if you don't know how to love yourself. So I urge you, let this worship be that time for you. Love yourself by letting God love you in this time together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how often you took time to steal away from the crowd to be with just yourself and the Heavenly Father. How often you would take your disciples with you and then walk away to a quiet, secluded place and pray as long as you wanted to. We live in such a fast-paced, hurried world with deadlines, schedules, obligations, and tasks that all have to be done. And they're all important and have their place, but Lord, nothing can take the place of the time we spend with you that our soul requires in order to truly be alive in you. Forgive us when we fail to take that time, when we decide other things are more important. Remind us how you, as the Savior of the world, regularly spent time alone with the Father, listening, learning, and growing in wisdom. Free us from our exhaustive need to be busy with things. Teach us the meaning of Sabbath. For we pray in your blessed name. Amen. Today's theme is taking time to pray, that holy, sacred time. We conclude the scripture from the brother of Jesus as James closes out his letter to that first generation of Christians, focusing on the importance of prayer. We also learn the pattern of Jesus that he set for himself and others when it comes to prayer. When you think about it, prayer is such an important part of Christian life. It certainly is when it comes to worship. And one of the songs I learned at a very tender age describes the importance of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bid. My soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, the joys I feel. The bliss I share of those whose anxious spirits burn with strong desires for thy return. With such I hasten to the place where God my Savior shows his face and gladly take my station there and wait for the sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer thy wings 
shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless and since he bids me seek his face believe his word and trust his grace I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer what a lovely hymn it was written by William Walford in 1845 now, according to one source Walford was a blind lay pastor in England when he penned the words to Sweet Hour Prayer. And the song quickly grew in popularity in America where it first appeared in Baptist hymnals and then eventually making its way in our Methodist hymnal and many others. One of the professors of sacred music at my seminary concluded that while this hymn is a sentimental favorite among many Christians, its focus is on private devotion and really has little to say about public prayer or prayer in worship, and that it would be better suited for individual devotion instead of worship. But I believe that rightly understood, with all due respect, that the hymn speaks to the need all of us have for a balance in our prayer life. There are times, especially in our worship, when the focus of prayer is for others and the needs of the world and the mission we have to the people of this world when we pray together. But we must balance this with our own personal spiritual need to lift this truth up in worship through a hymn that is focused on personal prayer time is very appropriate, I think. Doing so doesn't downplay our prayers for others or the needs of the world. It simply addresses the need all of us have to spend time with God in prayer. I would go so far as to say that we need intimate time with God in order to be fully present when we come together in fellowship and worship. That's the pattern Jesus set, isn't it? When he would often get away to a lonely place to spend time alone with God. And that hymn recognizes our humanity as well as the humanity of our Lord. And with this, let us hear today's scripture beginning in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. The second reading is from the Gospel of Luke in chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. Once when he was... In one of the cities, there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. And then Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him and said, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he ordered him to tell no one. Go, he said, and show yourself to the priest and as Moses commanded, make an offering for your cleansing for testimony to them. But now, more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds would gather to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. But he would withdraw to, be, to deserted places and pray. For the Christian, prayer is the lifeline to God. Nearly every psalm is a form of prayer. Those who practice a disciplined prayer life begin and end each day in prayer. For every 
meal, we ask for God's blessing in a prayer. Whenever we gather with other Christians, prayer, prayer is a big part of that time. In our worship, we lift concerns and joys to others uh, and uh, among our, uh, ourselves and others through prayer. We petition the Lord who taught his disciples to pray. We intercede for others by praying. We praise God through prayer. And in our singing, many of the songs are a form of prayer when you think about it. In fact, there was a time when prayer used to be offered at the beginning of all sports events. We've gotten away from that, which is too bad, I think. At the opening of every congressional meeting, a prayer is offered. It's comforting to know that different as all of us are and our elected officials are, and with such differing views on important matters, it's important to know that despite this, many people, including these elected leaders, still believe in the goodness and the importance of prayer. If you notice in today's gospel reading, the busier Jesus became, the more and more people gathered to hear him and to be healed, the more frequently he withdrew to pray. He needed that time. It wasn't that his prayer life got squeezed out by the increasing demands of the crowd. Rather, he committed himself to a regular time apart with God. That is such an important part of the Christian life and so often neglected. Of course, there are times when the crowd followed him and found him. Still, he protected his time with God by making prayer a habit. Someone once said, you can try to prioritize a busy schedule or you can schedule your priorities. Well, Jesus always scheduled his priorities by blocking out frequent time alone with God in prayer. Without that special time, he would have burned out as a human being, as we often do. He was a busy man and was routinely exhausted by the demands of the crowd. And so he reminded himself and others that as humans, we need to find that balance in our lives. He set the example. An example he learned, well, from his heavenly father, our heavenly father. That's the whole purpose of Sabbath, isn't it? You remember how on the seventh day the Lord God rested and set the Sabbath as a pattern for all of us to rest and renew our spirits? As if to say, if I, the Lord God, take this time, you as humans certainly should. And prayer is a big part of our Sabbath observance, whether it's personal time or together in worship. Now, why do you suppose God rested from all the work done on those other six days? Do you think it was because God was weary and exhausted? I don't think so. God doesn't get weary the way we do. It's because there is value in rest for its own sake. God doesn't work all the time, and neither should we. In God's great wisdom, God created that seventh day rest time, a rhythmical, regular balance between work and the cessation of work. We don't rest simply because we are exhausted and need to relax. We rest because it's built into the very fabric of creation itself. Let me say that again. We rest, we observe Sabbath primarily because it is built into the very fabric of creation. Prayer, then, like Sabbath, is a reminder to ourselves that there are regular intervals, times when we must stop doing and doing and doing in order to listen to God and experience holy recreation, recreation. Recently, my wife and I planted a spruce tree by the side of our home. There's a fully grown spruce tree on the other side of the street. We wanted to match it with another one on our side. And in 15 or so years, when it's fully mature, it'll stand tall like the other one, anywhere between 35 and 40 feet, they say. Every day for the first two weeks, I must give it five gallons of water. And you don't just dump the water on the tree or at the base of the tree. You have to turn the gallon milk jug that I'm using upside down so that the water comes out slowly and the water has a chance to seep down into the roots instead of flooding out beyond the tree where it won't do any good. And that means not being in a hurry. So I sit down on the lawn and listen to the jug of water as it goes glug, 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 glug. glug glug, until it's 
finally empty, and I then repeat the process uh, all around the tree until I've emptied five gallons of water. Simply the way you have to do it if I want to properly water this baby tree. I have to admit, at first I was in a hurry. I hadn't done it before, and I wanted to get it done so I could do other things, but I quickly learned I could not rush how fast the ground drank the water. You, you just can't rush Iowa clay. Am I right? And then an interesting thing happened. As I sat there waiting for the water to empty out as it was doing its glug glugs, I became aware of things I had not been paying attention to at all. I heard a flapping noise. What's that flapping noise? I looked around and I finally heard it again. It was my neighbor's flag, the stars and stripes waving in the breeze, making that flapping noise. It was pretty watching it and now hearing it. And then a crow began to call, and I listened to that for a while. And then I felt the grass and how soft and cool it was. A few glug-glugs later, I noticed a squirrel with a big fat walnut in its mouth. It looked like it was carrying a bowling ball. It was so big. And then I noticed how the leaves were shimmering in the breeze, and I began to relax and enjoy the time. I was no longer in a hurry. I was becoming part of the scenery living in the moment. And that time I spent with my milk jug full of water ended up being special time. You might even say sacred time. That plastic water jug slowed me down enough to enjoy it. And then I started to wonder how many other occasions have I missed because I was busy and in a hurry to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Prayer is like that. It centers us. It puts us in touch with God and God's creation, makes us aware of what's going around us and in us. We become more conscious of our dependence on God and the needs we have, our aches and pains, joys and sorrows, and the needs of others. We take the time to share them with God. We lay all the problems, the nits and picks, the burdens that we have at the altar of the Lord, and we learn in prayer, to let them go. And we become profoundly aware of our blessings, too, in our prayers as we pray. And we give thanks. And we trust that God will answer our prayers. And we live in that hope. And that moment becomes sacred time. Often we don't realize how important prayer is until we have prayed. We turn around and realize we are much more relaxed. The worries are not as bad. The problems may still be hanging around, but our attitude toward them has changed. We're not crushed by them. We're not as overwhelmed by anxiety and worry and distress. We've taken it to the Lord in prayer. Often there are times when I have had worries about things, family members, my immediate family and my church family and others who are going through a tough time. And then there are the problems of the world or disappointments that come my way as they come to everybody. I pray about it. And at some point, it's as if I lay that burden down at the Lord's feet and I can then walk away. I don't pick it up again and take it with me. I leave it with God. It's no longer my responsibility to carry it around or to try and answer my own prayer. God has it. More and more these days, you and I have relied uh, on vendors to ship packages to us at our home. Often it's less expensive, not as complicated. You go online, find what you need, order it, free shipping, and within a day or two, it's at your doorstep. Ever notice how when a delivery truck comes by with a, a package, how the carrier doesn't want to wait around to see if you're home? They drop it off, and they're gone. They may ring your door doorbell, they may not. But sometimes you don't even hear the doorbell. You just see the truck as it leaves. Maybe. My wife and I have learned to check the doorstep frequently if we're expecting a package. Prayer is like that. Only you can trust that when you leave your troubles with the Lord through prayer, God will open the door immediately and bring that package inside and do the right thing with it. We don't have to wait around and worry about it. God has your prayer and mine. and will answer it in God's time and in God's perfect way. In the letter to, from James, he tells these early Christians to pray in every occasion 
If you're suffering, pray about it. God listens. If this were not the case, most of the Bible would never have been written. Instead, it is chock full of testimony from those who are suffering and who trusted in the Lord and prayed about it. But that's not the only occasion. When you're cheerful, praise the Lord. Praise is a form of prayer. Let the song that's in your heart come out of your mouth and sing. You know, it's, it's like the happy birthday song. Really. Recently, my grandson celebrated his fourth birthday. Yes, uh, as a grandfather, you're going to hear uh, more than one sermon from me uh, in reference to my grandchildren. You'll have to deal with it. This year, my, my grandson celebrated the occasion uh, of his fourth birthday with the other set of grandparents. It was their turn. And we received a video of everyone singing happy birthday. Now, I don't know who it was. It was a, a male voice, but someone was singing happy birthday out of tune. And not just a little bit. He would find the tune and he would lose the tune. Find it and then he would lose it. Sort of sounded like a goose. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. He was all over the place. He couldn't find the tune. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. It, it doesn't matter if you can sing at a happy birthday. When it's someone's, certain someone's birthday, you sing happy birthday, right? Of course. Doesn't matter if you can sing or not. It's a happy occasion. Everyone sings. And you don't say, well, I don't sing well, so I'm not going to sing at your birthday. No, you sing happy birthday. Of course. Same thing when you're cheerful. When we are cheerful, when life on this Earth, life God has given us, gives us joy. The creature sings. When you experience the life we have through Christ, we sing full-throated, full-throttled and full-throated. You open your mouth and you praise God with your voice. And that song, that praise, is a prayer. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. That is a prayer sung. Doesn't matter if we can sing well or not. We sing. It explains why Charles Wesley, the brother of John Wesley, wrote over 6,000 hymns, including Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. We praise God. We thank God. We sing. And in the singing, we communicate with God. Very special kind of prayer. Growing up, my pastor sang with the voice of a frog. It sounded more like croaking. Still, he sang. He sang not because he was a good singer. He sang because God is good. He sang because he believed. He sang to praise God. Some of us may not be able to carry a tune in a bucket. Well, if you sing, I'll bring you the bucket. Lift your prayer of praise to the Lord who hears. James encourages his people to pray for those who are sick. When we're sick in our church, in every church I've ever been associated with, we pray for those who are sick. At every worship, and as often as we can, we pray for those who are ill. Sometimes our prayers are answered in dramatic ways. A person was sick, and now they are healed, and we praise God. Sometimes a person doesn't seem to be getting any better. Nevertheless, we pray. In verse 15, James tells the people to call the elders of the church. Have them pray for the sick. He declares, the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. For James, you see, there is no distinction between physical healing and spiritual. They are intertwined. You can't have one without the other. It explains why he tells the people that the prayer of the faithful will save the sick. One way or the other, they will be healed. Their bodies may be wasting away. But in God's time, they will be, they'll be completely healed, body, mind, and spirit, raised to new life, even as they rose to life when they took Jesus as their Savior. Salvation. Complete salvation, where all that sickness and death and dying is gone, forever gone. Complete salvation. God's ultimate answer to our prayer. After praying that this cup shall pass, Jesus accepted the death he was to die. He prayed about it, and the answer to his prayer was not the answer he was looking for when he was praying in the garden. But the Heavenly Father had something far greater in mind. There are times 
when you and I pray to God and our prayers are not answered the way we had hoped. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't answer our prayers. It means God has something far greater in mind. According to Luke's gospel, the last words Jesus spoke on the cross was, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Note, he didn't say, I give up. He didn't say, well, this was a waste of time. No, he did not lose faith, curse God, and die. Instead, he prayed. And it was a good prayer, too. He trusted God with his whole life. That last prayer was a faithful prayer. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. And then he let it go. He let go of his very life, his spirit. He prayed that prayer and gave it up. Gave it back to the Father. And three days later, God raised him up. That was God's answer to his son's prayer that day. And that answer became his and our salvation. And now salvation through him. A perfect answer to prayer. God will answer our prayers too. And in the best way. It explains why James closes his thoughts on prayer by telling his people to pray for each other. I'll pray for you and you pray for me. It becomes a time when sins are forgiven and when the moments in life are sacred. When we pray as a congregation of the faithful and feel the effective power of prayer and where answers come. We may not always see it in the moment, but the answers come. We wait for it. We trust God. We leave it with God and we hope. We rest assured that God will answer our prayers. There are lots of mysteries to life, aren't there? But this much we know. God answers prayer. The more we take time with God in prayer, the more we make that a regular part of our lives, we align ourselves with God's will. And the more our very lives become a prayer that God raises to new life. Oh God, you hear us whenever we pray. Not a word is unheard. You answer us in your perfect wisdom. May we take that sacred time to pray to you, to center our souls on you, and to be made perfect in love through you. May our, your grace enter our prayers and give us the assurance that you are always listening, always loving, always present, if we would but slow down and pray, whether it be alone or with others. For we pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless and since he bids me see. grace I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee sweet hour of prayer Amen. May your life be a prayer and may your relationship with God be an answer to your prayer. Go in peace. May the love of Christ surround you. Fare you well in this day that God has made. And all God's people said, Amen. Bye now. God bless.